Welcome to the fourth installation of our Live at the Velocity Center program series. The Live at the Velocity Center is a simulcast program series developed to facilitate collaboration between thought leaders and community members to provide open access to innovators, inventors, educators, and investors. Using this open forum, and we, in this open forum, <laughs> it's probably important that those of us who are online would mute themselves. We do have the capability of muting you, but if you could mute yourself um, and be ready to chat in questions later, that would be great. We also provide lectures, talks, and informational program content. We hope to empower our community to participate in discovering new technologies and new business opportunities for the Indian Head Enterprise Zone and the Southern Maryland region. We are proud to be hosting this series as a simulcast at the College of Southern Maryland's Velocity Center. This is a place of innovation, learning, and collaboration for academia, the Navy, and the community. This collaborative learning space in Indian Head, Maryland supports workforce development, economic growth in Southern Maryland, and overall community development. Here, we help educate, train, expand, and retain the ta talent pipeline for Southern Maryland and the state, as well as assist in professional development and collaborative projects between academia, industry, and government. The Navy utilizes the center, and I think we're experiencing that today, for conferences, meetings, showcases, and to hold a multitude of professional development activities and events. Navy scientists and industry leaders can interact with students in tech transfer courses, and they have a place to tinker and conduct unclassified research. <laughs> the community can take advantage of the maker space in the Velocity Center, as well as workforce and professional development courses, such as community-aided design, cybersecurity drones, small unmanned aircraft systems, government procurement, social entrepreneurship, and tech transfer entrepreneurship. You get the picture. We offer a lot. You're excited, right? <laughs> so we invite you to come over to Indian Head to check us out. We have one more opportunity for you to join us here in person or virtually for this particular program series. On January 19th, we will discuss what a makerspace is and how we can use it. Simply visit us at csmd.edu VC series. Again, I'll repeat that and it'll probably be in the chat for you. csmd.edu VC series forward slash VC series to get more information. All right, so in March of this year, we kicked off this series by discussing the innovators around us. Last month, we invited, a uh, month before last, we invited community experts in workforce development and skills training. And last month, we were, we're taking, we took on experiential learning and innovation with a panel of youth innovators and inventors. And so I am so pleased to welcome these folks with us. We're literally going to talk about the fine arts, visual arts, and STEAM as it relates to innovation. And I'm hoping that you are listening attentively and that you jump in after I have dialogued with them for a bit with questions and comments of your own. Here in person, we're, we're going to ask that you share your questions with us verbally and I'll just repeat them over the microphone for our simulcast audience. Um, and we hope that those of you virtually will put your questions in the chat because we do want to engage with you. Your comments, your questions, your uh, compliments and suggestions, we want them all. Let's get to our panelists. So I'm going to start right in the middle because she's the first one on my page. Our first panelist is Angelica Jackson. Miss Angelica Jackson is the Chief Executive Officer and Co-Founder and co-founder of the Phoenix International School of the Arts. 
Uh, I'm so excited. I have a 12 year old Charles County's first ever public charter middle school and the first dual study program in the arts and international studies in our community. Miss Jackson is a facilitator on accelerating learning strategies for the national nonprofit diverse charter schools coalition and she is affiliated with several innovative education organizations, such as 4.0 Schools, Transcend Education, and Catalyst at Penn GSE. Ms. Jackson is committed to dramatically improving educational outcomes of all students, uplifting historically exploited communities, and preparing the next generation of global artists, innovators, scholars, and change makers. She's a national thought leader and education innovator and works closely with leaders from other sectors. In addition to consulting with agencies, nonprofit organizations, and school leaders, she also works in the film and theater industries. Ms. Jackson taught theater for the School District of Philadelphia, as well as in Southern New Jersey, and is an award-winning musical theater performer who has been seen on stages from DC to New York City. We are blessed with her presence. <laughs> and so she holds a degree from the University of Virginia, a master's from the University of Pennsylvania's Graduate School and the Wharton School of Business. I have so many other things I could share here, but we are going to give you information about um, the Phoenix International School of the Arts in just a little while. Help me welcome Miss Angelica Jackson. Thank you for being with us. Our second panelist is Mr. Dr. Stephen Johnson, all the way on the end. He's the Associate Dean of the School of Liberal Arts and Chair of Visual and Performing Arts at College of Southern Maryland. His education is in the theory and history of music, and his performance areas are piano, trombone, and Latin percussion. I love that. His research interests include the 19th century orchestra music, Latin American music, the music of film scores, and the music of the Beatles. I have to remember that. <laughs> he is a supporter of interdisciplinary studies and is a keen advocate of the intersection of the fine arts with technology, perfect for this panel, and other STEM areas. He has been the coordinator of performing arts for seven years. Help me welcome Dr. Stephen Johnson. And our next panelist, we have a nice healthy panel today, is Gabby Chan. Wave at us, Gabby. She is primarily self-taught as a digital artist and graphic designer. She graduated from UCLA in 2017 with a BS in psychobiology. Ooh, I like that. And since becoming a student at CSM, she has taken courses in graphic design and areas of vis other areas of visual art, including ceramics oil painting and photography to further her develop uh, to further develop her skills and to gain experience working with other mediums between time at uh, between her time at UCLA and now she has acted as as the UCLA Chinese cultural Di dance clubs say that five times the UCLA Chinese cultural dance clubs graphic designer and has interned with the Charles County Public library as a graphic designer. We're so happy to have you. Help me welcome Gabby Chan. Our fourth panelist is Brian David Gomez. Hello there. He is a third semester student at CSM, majoring in digital media production. His time with the program has landed him work within the media field. And over this past summer, Brian has worked on the camera crew with the Southern Maryland Blue Crabs, Go Blue Crabs. And he currently works as an assistant in CSM's digital media lab, where he helps students learn both the equipment and software used in the program. So happy to have you. Help me welcome Brian. And last but not least, closest to me, our last panelist is Professor Brent Ferguson. Dr. Brent Ferguson is a composer, a musician, a sound designer, and narrative uh, designer doing more work in the audio design of video games. How exciting. He teaches at the College of Southern Maryland and prides himself on helping students secure opportunities. 
On November 21st, for example, and we'll share other examples, the faculty at CSM is putting on a recital at the Indian Head, we're right in Indian Head, Indian Head Black Box Theater, and Professor Ferguson will be playing some preludes by Brazilian composer Villa Lobos on the classical guitar, as well as electric bass with the faculty ensemble. Help me thank our panelists for joining us. Yay! So happy to have you all here. We'll start by asking you all some questions and would love for you all in the audience and virtually to send us your comments and your questions. Uh, they will be sent to me through osmosis, if you will. And so, <laughs> so I'll be able to share them with you aloud. First, I would love for each of you to just tell me in your own words about the work that you do. I know I did a formal introduction, but knowing exactly what your work is in your own words from your heart will help set the stage for this discussion. Uh, Dr. Johnson, we'll start with you. Sure, yeah. Well, um, the, uh, the fine arts program at, uh, at CSM have really gone through a lot of growth in, the, in really in the last 10 years or so. I've, I've arrived here at 2005 as a uh, music professor and then uh, seven years I became seven years ago I became chair of arts and humanities which uh, then a couple years ago I became the chair of fine arts when we further reorganized and uh, but during during this time uh, I've experienced a lot of growth at CSM um, we we've made some uh, very important curricular changes. In fact, Dr. Ferguson and I are working on some changes this, this very year. We hope to start next uh, in the fall of 2022. So um, my role at CSM currently is, um, uh, I am the chair of, of performing and visual arts. So I, I do work with my colleagues in, in, um, in the visual arts, painting, drawing, ceramics, um, as well as theater, dance, and digital media. And, uh, as in my role as associate dean, though, as well, I am also uh, the point person for several initiatives for the entire School of Liberal Arts, which also includes the humanities, English, communication, and, and foreign language. Um, so over the over the years, in my my role uh, in the music program, I've I've created the, uh, the the Latin ensemble, which actually will also be performing in December, Yay. December 11th, and Dr. Ferguson's a member of that group as well. Um, as well as uh, teaching, uh, teaching the foundational music theory courses in, in the program. Um, I have not been, uh, although I'm a pianist and a trombonist, uh, I have not been active really as much as a performer in CSM's program. Um, that's mo mostly my interests uh, on the outside, including, uh, including playing in pit orchestras for high school musicals and, and, and things like that. Really cool. Um, so really, um, I guess you could say right now I'm wearing several hats at CSM. I'm also the interim theater coordinator um, as, we're, as we're hoping to <laughs> search for a new theater professor in, in the coming couple of years, next couple of years. Yeah, thank you so much. This gives so much context about the expertise you bring to the panel, but also how much is available to us in the Southern Maryland region related to the arts. So thank you for that. And Gabby, please feel free to share. Hi. Yep, long as it's green, you're good. <laughs> so uh, as noted, I am a digital illustrator and graphic designer. So for me, um, uh, that's included like personal illustration work, uh, character design. Um, in terms of the more design focused side, that's uh, included uh, designing for online advertising, um, you know, Facebook icons and banners, um, making sure uh, our advertising materials are suitable for online uh, channels, and then also making sure those materials are ready for print as well. So we think of uh, posters, um, pamphlets that you would get at a, at a um, art, uh, some sort of performance, um, things of that nature. And I love that you have explored other mediums as well, in addition to the work that you do. So thank you so much for sharing here. And Dr. Jackson, <laughs> um, please share a little bit more. Give us context about what you do and what you love. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. Um, so in short, I am a conduit um, and an amplifier for youth voice. Mm. I believe in the power of youth voice, um, and particularly for those youth who are more creatively inclined, 
um, and want to tell their story or connect their communities or um, just heal through the arts. So everything that I do, whether it's in education, whether it is directing a theater show or um, anything professionally and personally, it has to do with uplifting youth voice and, and showing them that they can reach their fullest potential no matter their circumstances. Yeah, I love that. I love that. And we've had so many conversations during this series about the importance of even though we are a college, we are reaching out to our middle school and our high school students um, to, for the pipeline to make sure that they are as ready, as college ready as possible. So it's important the work that you're doing to be a voice for them. Thank you for that. And Brian, yes, sir, tell us a bit about more of what you do. I'm going to be bested by this mic. Um, uh, well, as a student, or someone that's still currently a student, uh, I don't really have as many exciting things to <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, people who spoke before. The fact that you're a student makes it exciting, Brian. <laughs> uh, said, uh, I'm a digital media production major. Um, I got into the program because uh, I've always had an interest in film. Um, so like a lot of people that get in this program, I had this, uh, grand idea that it was going to be, a the next filmmaker, you know, making these, uh, well-received love films. Uh, Brian, can you move the mic to you? Sorry. Just, yeah. Probably. And, uh, I can move it up a little bit. Um, oh, it's, it's challenging you. Is that very good? Okay. And, um, so yeah, I had these, I had this dream of being, uh, the, you know, a filmmaker, uh, but my time in the program, while I do enjoy filmmaking, I will say it's not as fun as I thought it was going to be. <laughs> um, there's just a lot of little things that crop up, setbacks, uh, you know, schedule problems, stuff like that. Uh, but during my time in the program, I found that I really enjoy editing because uh, that's really where the stories in film come to life, whether they're, you know, fiction or documentary. It's taking that footage that was filmed and piecing it together correctly to make this cohesive story mm. that I really enjoy doing. And um, yeah, like over the previous or the previous seven weeks of the semester, I made a documentary on um, EMT or, or emergency medical technicians, people that work on the ambulance. Oh my goodness. And um, when I set out to make that project, the vision that I had was vastly different than the final product because <laughs> in the midst of filming, I was learning information that I hadn't known. And there was like a deeper story to this field than I could have ever realized. And it was just really neat going out there, filming that and discovering, you know, this story that you didn't expect. And that was like really exciting to tell. And it so far has been very well received by the people who have seen it. So Yes, well, kudos to you. I thought you didn't have anything exciting to share. <laughs> And so, uh, Dr. Ferguson, if you could just share a little bit in your own words about the work that you're doing. Yep, it'll just be holding on to it for a moment and then letting it go. It doesn't. Yeah, well, there we go. <laughs> well, sorry about that. Pleasure to meet you. Um, I, I guess the best thing I could really talk about in this time is uh, by teaching. Uh, I've been teaching for about 15 years now uh, in music and um, it's really um, my, my mission to, um, to give my students opportunities, to provide my students and to help them find opportunities as well, not only within music, but within other careers such as video games, uh, film as well. And um, it's one of the reasons I got into video game design was to create uh, you know, things to, for my students to be able to score. And mm -hmm. they always talk about, I wanna get into video game design, I wanna do this, I wanna do that, well, here's your chance. Now you get to do it. So uh, I like, you know, throwing students into the deep end of the pool, but also just um, uh, giving them the opportunity of being really supportive. Uh, part of music school is often, it, it's often abusive. And I, I went, I had some very abusive teachers and it taught me what not to do. Yeah. So it's really about, for me, it's about teaching with compassion. Mm -hmm and helping just provide those opportunities because you never really get that in music school a lot of the times. It's a lot of being trained like a dog. Um, mm. I, I want to just be like, no, you, you have a career after this and let's help you get to that career. 
Yeah. Oh my goodness. You all's passion just comes through so clearly. And I love, I, I mentioned to the panel before we started, um, who knew that we would put together fine arts, visual arts and STEAM, right? But, um, but because they all fall in the, under the category of innovation and uh, creativity, that's what this center here at the Velocity Center in Indian Head is all about. So it is the, the most, I think the most fun, I'll say right now, combination of, of, of folks together uh, and topic that we can cover. So I'll ask you in the spirit of innovation, uh, when you think of innovations regarding your work, uh, your artistry, um, what comes to mind? What's happening either in your personal work or in your area of industry that feels really innovative to you right now? Anyone wanna go first? Yeah, please, Brian. And you're welcome to keep your phone, your, uh, Microphone's on. Okay. Um, as far as innovations, at least with uh, digital filmmaking, um, I guess the introduction of uh, 4K cameras is something that I think was a big deal uh, for, the, uh, for the field. And the fact that in recent years, they have become more and more affordable for consumers. Like I have a Panasonic HCVX981K. I'm so glad I wrote that down. <laughs> that shoots in 4K, it has pretty much cinema quality picture. And if you have the right you know, sound equipment, you know, cinema quality sound, and this is a $900 camera, which, you know, for some people that might sound kind of high, but when you compare it to, the, you know, thousands of dollars that these things used to be in previous years, you know, that's, that's really great that now anyone who has a passion for filmmaking in any, you know, form, has that ability to obtain equipment to, you know, deliver quality uh, productions. Um, and also uh, the majority of cell phones now shoot in 4K. So it's like, you know, people have the ability to film on the go. And that also coincides with, you know, the creation of the cloud where, you know, stuff can be uploaded at any time. Um, as well as editing software that is actually able to be used on the phone. So you could film something, edit it, upload it on the cloud, and it's readily available to anyone that you give access to, which, you know, that's very helpful in fields like news media, where if there's a story happening right then and there, and everyone knows that when it comes to news, it's about getting that story out as quick as possible. Yeah. And, you know, all these innovations have made that possible. So You're making me feel like I could become a filmmaker right now, right here. <laughs> It's affordable, it's accessible, I can learn it. Okay, no, that's really good to hear that it is becoming more affordable because accessibility, all of innovation and creativity, it's all about what you can imagine for yourself. And if you can't imagine it because of finances or anything else, it's a, it's a barrier. So thank you for sharing that. Anyone else, what's innovative happening in your area? I'd love to build on that by um, speaking to theater and performing arts, mm -hmm. um, which is my background. Um, but the pandemic has forced theater artists to really kind of move into the film space in a way. Um, <laughs> even our local high school students who participate in the theater productions have gone to Zoom or, you know, virtual formats to, to do readings and um, to make connections when they are in their individual households and they're still able to put a theater show together. So that has been um, something that I've been super proud to see um, young people do and, and be encouraged to do. Um, there's also been, if you're familiar with um, a, a phone application called Clubhouse, um, it's an app that allows people from all over the world to have courageous conversations um, by just turning on a microphone and speaking. And so they've been putting on musicals on this, on this app, um, staged, or I guess they're not really staged, but readings of plays um, on this app. And again, these are connecting people from um, all over the world. So I, I really see um, innovation in the way that people are getting connected, the way that they're telling stories. Um, I, uh, I've seen some in-person theater shows during the pandemic where they're one person shows and um, they, it's like guerrilla theater, meaning that 
um, it's theater happening in different parts of a space. It could be around town and um, the audience is only up to five people in this audience and they're going to a remote location to see a theater show um, or to hear a story from this one person show. And it's just really cool, um, really interactive. So it's been fun to see how um, theater makers are still telling stories, still inciting and, and motivating people through storytelling, um, but in a way that's been safe. That's amazing. Oh my goodness. And I have, I have theater in my background. So <laughs> I'm loving to hear how the innovations are, are working in the arts. Dr. Johnson. Yes, I, I actually wanted to follow up on a little bit of what she was saying, because we, uh, the, the word that comes to mind in the performing arts, of course, is improvisation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the, um, during this past 18, 19 months now, um, the uh, the performing the visual arts we've we it's been fairly easy to put together uh, virtual gallery shows I, I think Gabby you've been involved you know watching those and um, but um, our uh, voice teacher Dr. Anthony Zwerling back in April of 2020 remember what we were doing back then yeah yeah we were like closing our doors and uh, uh, our voice teacher Dr. Zwerling actually uh, had this very innovative idea of Putting, we have an, uh, a biannual uh, student honors recital, mm. and which is always a live event in the theater on the La Plata campus. And so uh, that April, uh, he came up with the idea of just reaching out to the students in each of the studios, film yourself singing or playing the piano or accompanying somebody or doing a duet or something like that. And, and of course, a student recital is the easiest first step in something like that. It's, yeah. You know, it's it's um, putting together performances is not what you see on YouTube when you see a 60 voice choir. Mm -hmm. It's this is very orchestrated. That's not it's not like they all turn their zoom on and, and it happened. And not, yeah, so we, we so then starting this last fall, we we were able to actually put together a virtual concerts for, for our two professional series, as well as our student uh, ensembles, the choirs, the, the, we have a barbershop group as well. Yeah. And I think um, the, and then the gallery shows, and we have actually had a, a 10 minute dance capstone project, which we put on YouTube for the public. And, uh, so I think, I think, you know, improvising, this was a perfect time to improvise mm -hmm. and innovate. Yeah. It, it's almost like, um, uh, limitations <laughs> cause us to have to innovate <laughs> and come up with things. Um, that's awesome. Anyone else want to share about, yeah, what innovations have come up? Yeah, and Dr. Johnson and Dr. Jackson have already put it really eloquently on how we've had to adapt as performers uh, and as ensembles. It's as everyone just said, it's almost impossible to do it via Zoom. But uh, what this has, um, what this has also done is um, really created opportunities for uh, disabled musicians, housebound musicians mm -hmm. that aren't really able to go to recitals, um, conferences oh, so for the great. scholars. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's, it's provided that opportunity, uh, and it's, uh, it's something that is really big in music making as well as trying to provide opportunities, trying to provide, um, ways for people who, um, don't, don't have opportunities to, to play a keyboard, to have a keyboard, uh, to be able to have a free one on a computer, to be able to voice, mm -hmm. or dictate, to yeah. be able to compose just by saying uh, things like you would from Microsoft Word, dictating like that uh, mm -hmm. sort of uh, novel. I'm kind of going in circles now. No, gonna... no, it's really great. You've named a whole lot. You had me thinking about um, when you you went into the dictation of it, but before that, when we when you were talking, I'm wondering what is that technology? What is the app? What is the technology that allows folks to talk at the same time? during Zoom or to sing at the same time, um, because that seems revolutionary <laughs> because you can't talk over top of each other. Do you, do you all know any of those names of apps or? It's okay if you don't, I just. It's, yeah, one, of our, one of our instructors, music appreciation instructors is um, uh, Dr. Phil Ravita, he's from the Baltimore area. And he, he, he's very familiar with that. And he's one of our few uh, ensemble directors that was actually able to plug in these apps, which take care, they, they take care of the, um, the lag that occurs when yeah. you have, let's say, 20 people 
each on a Zoom call. That I'll tell you that that kind of technological um, peril truly frightens me when I consider doing it. <laughs> and but but he seemed to really have a good handle on that. And so you know we're actually looking into you know what is is there is there an affordable um, version of this that we could get to the college if we ever have to do that again. Yeah, that's amazing, amazing. And I didn't want to miss. Did you, did you want to share any innovations that you've noticed, Gabby? Sure. Um, so I obviously I'm working more in like illustration and design. So uh, a lot of the things that I think about are that there are just so many such a variety of types of these programs available. Um, there are some even available for free, and there are so uh, even though that these programs are evolving on their own, the artists who utilize them also are creating assets for these things like digital brushes, uh, fonts, stock images, and making tutorials on how to use them. And often they will share these things online or free. Um, so it's really making these sorts of technologies accessible again. Um, both uh, financially and just who has access to them. Um, and it's really influenced how we can share our artwork for both personal enjoyment as well as advertising ourselves in more professional capacities. That's awesome. That is awesome. I love the accessibility piece. And you've mentioned it in a couple of different ways as a panel. I guess I'm wondering how dependent are you? <laughs> we could we let's put it under the guise of the pandemic, but now we know that this is the new normal, right? There are there's really no going back to exactly the way that things were. And so you've named some innovations that are really key for you right now, have you personally had to get to know technology in a different way <laughs> as a result in order to practice your art? Um, and could you just speak to that, how technology is driving um, specifically, you know, whatever it is, I, I, we're talking apps, we're talking uh, equipment, we're talking software, the cloud. Um, how have you personally had to use technology um, in your work and, and how has it changed as a result? Anyone want to share? I'll jump right in. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, please. This is um, it's it's something that I was I was trying to get used to before the pandemic. Yeah, I was trying to create those opportunities to show people that they can see them. Yeah, and I this is back in my PhD program. Yeah, I was trying to tell my teachers like we should be thinking about this. <laughs> we might want to think about this, especially for ear training, things that you wouldn't normally be able to do. Um, and they said it's not possible. Yeah. And I heard that over and over. So to you. Over and over and over again. And um, and now suddenly with the, with the pandemic, it's become possible by force. And those that really didn't, um, didn't adapt have left uh, the music mm -hmm. discipline for the most part. Um, performance has especially been affected, as Dr. Johnson mentioned. Um, we've had to adapt, you know, do um, uh, get into Zoom. Uh, Dr. Jackson has mentioned the, um, the moving into film for theater people. Um, so it's it's become something we've had to do, and and some people have had to really learn it. Um, I'm, it's forced me to become a lot better at Zoom because I wasn't, I wasn't as adept. Um, but it's also forced my students to learn how to work, work the studio, yeah. how to work the DAW. And thank goodness there's free programs out there and they can, they can actually produce their, um, their materials to, to be, you know, the, the best that it, that it can be for um, some, some random. No, it's great. It's great. Brent, you, you made me think about the fact that some in, in most industries, if they were not ahead of the curve in technology, um, some many have not made it through this very difficult pandemic time. And the symphonies and orchestras. 
Yeah, symphonies and orchestras, just um, those who have been able to stay alive during it or revive themselves, it's really because they have connected to technology. Any other thoughts about just the importance of it, Dr. Johnson? Uh, I think kind of following up what Brent was talking about, um, one of the areas that we uh, at CSM that we've actually found ourselves kind of thrust into the, into the category of subject matter experts the, the fine art, particularly the performing arts, you know, theater, dance, and, and music, uh, is that when the college has, has developed modalities over the last two years on how to teach, we, we have a modality called real-time technology, which really, really works well with music, but other areas, you know, for example, you know, synchronous, synchronous real-time technology over, over Zoom to teach philosophy? No way, <laughs> you know, but, but in teaching the music, we, we, we have now, you know, we're performers, we're improvisers, and it's actually come naturally, and Dr. Ferguson and I both taught in that modality before. And another area that, it, when you mentioned that the technology, having to take advantage of the technology, the technology, not necessarily electronic technology, but, but materials technology, yes. for example, we have actually been approached about that as well. So for example, we have plexiglass shields Mm -hmm. that are used yeah. to make better social distancing for rehearsals or if you have a private lesson where you have a you basically have a have a nine by nine practice room that's not socially acceptable yeah. distancing yeah um but uh, i mean i've been approached about well how do how do i project my voice when i have a when i'm wearing a face shield you know things like that yeah and it's it's it has kind of created some interesting new context of teaching yeah that is amazing um, the idea that we have had to innovate, not just the electronic technology, the digital technology, but literally the hardware that we use around us is different than it has ever been before. Um, and I'm sure we're all zoomed out. We, thank, you, thank you for those who have taken on an extra Zoom today. Um, but the idea is that we, we have to stay connected and we're finding ways to do that even in the arts. I wanna quickly ask um, Dr. Jackson a question about, because you're working with charter schools in ch you have co-founded one, um, a part of your background is STEM, STEAM. And so I wanted to ask you what you thought about um, just that technology piece related to our young people and how they are faring um, related to education. Um, what, what is that alignment that's, uh, that's affecting them in education, if you wouldn't mind sharing? Sure. So um, my specialty is working with adolescents, young adolescents. So um, that's the middle school age. Yeah. And an, a huge part, as you all probably can imagine, of their um, academic experience is social. Mm -hmm. And so um, I'm sure you all can experience, have had, or know this as parents or as someone who um, teaches young people um, that being disconnected um, at home has been tough. Um, they, students have been wanting to be in person. They've been wanting to have their dances and all the social events that happen in school. Um, what has been successful has been um, really allowing youth to say and contribute and have agency in, in what they're learning. Um, so I think that for schools that are not really taking in how kids are, are experiencing this time um, are struggling to to really meet their needs. Um, I did wanna mention that one piece of technology that, is, that I have seen to be really useful is, um, I cannot remember the name of it, but it's the camera that follows movement and follows um, students. And so in arts education, I've seen that to be something that's very useful. And it is a, a technology that has been adapted from um, accessibility technologies for students who are differently, or people who are differently abled. And so one thing that I've seen my students really get excited about is exploring and researching how technology and how arts have informed technology in different types of um, affinity groups and identity groups, um, and then creating ways that they can implement that into their daily lives. Um, so again, just really learning from kids 
<laughs> like that, that is that the end period. That's the story, like allowing them to really um, have some say into how they're learning, um, how they want to really connect during this time. Um, and then for those who are more fortunate, um, there I actually studied social enterprise um, in Bangladesh who they were, they're booming in like microfinancing, social uh, innovation and things like that. Um, and what they implement is community style um, learning and, com and also community style public health. So um, for those families that can do this, um, I really do recommend having those families get together in small groups in person in a way that they feel safe and allowing um, a tutor to come in or a teacher or, or some, someone, a student from CSM, <laughs> you know, to come in and um, engage with them so that there can be some more in-person um, engagement um, in whatever subject that, that they, the students need. Yeah, I love that. I love those suggestions. Let our students lead us and also listening for and, and attending to their social needs. That's awesome. We want to hear from you all. I do have, I could go on and on. I have tons of questions and I love the arts. Um, we want to ask some questions of our students as well, um, but we want to hear your questions, your comments, anything that you'd like to share. We are open to all things innovation, creative and STEAM and, uh, and the arts. So please put them in the chat. Just wave at me if you're here and you'd like to ask anything of our uh, of our panelists. I would love to know from Gabby from a perspective of dealing with digital, but in addition to textile arts, just being able to touch, I think you mentioned you've dabbled in ceramics and some others. Um, are there technologies that are connected to that? Um, has, has, have those arts changed to your knowledge of what is used and utilized when it comes to the textile arts? Um, I dabble. <laughs> I'm sorry. Right, no, you're fine. There are, I personally haven't um, experienced a lot of those just yeah. because my uh, current experience with those things have been uh, limited to the courses I've taken at CSM. Yeah. Um, obviously, there are always new techniques being made, um, how, how, paint, how oil paints are made um, and how they can be utilized on the canvas um, and the tools that can be used in ceramics, new techniques uh, using uh, glazes, um, how things are fired and things of that nature. Um, but I'm yeah. not an expert on that. So no, you, and you don't have to be, you're a practitioner of it. And so the idea that you have taken classes on it makes you much more of an expert than I. <laughs> So, so we really appreciate your sharing about that. But I hear you, how it's fired up is probably um, has evolved over time. And then, as you mentioned, the glazes and the mixes that are created. I really appreciate you sharing that. I'd love to know, um, you mentioned the camera, Brian. And so are there some other things, maybe either in the documentary that you've done or something you're even looking forward to utilizing? Maybe this camera has become affordable, but what are you looking forward to utilizing maybe that you haven't had a chance yet as it relates to the technologies and innovation? Um, well, there is actually, uh, I, I don't know the name of the camera, but uh, I stumbled upon a YouTube video about a week or two ago that was all about this camera that was coming out. It had, uh, it was a gimbal, it had stabilizer, it had all this great stuff, 4K you know, capabilities. And I know when I say that it's $7,000, that, that is a lot of money, but um, the capabilities that this camera you know, has and the potential that you know, independent filmmakers, um, you know, it, the, the potential it offers independent filmmakers, that $7,000, that is a really good price considering that the majority of you know, studio equipment is a lot more than that. So uh, I've been, Kind of keeping an eye on this. I really would <laughs> like when this camera comes out to be able, you know, I, granted, I'm going to have to set, set aside uh, a lot of money, maybe sell some organs. I don't know, but uh, uh, it definitely is. Yeah, your cash app. No. <laughs> 
But the idea of a $7,000 investment for um, a career shift, you know, or, or for um, um, a growth in your career that could allow you to do more and create more, I think it does. It sounds like a wise investment. So we use what we have until, until we get what we, what we can get more of. So I appreciate that. I'd love for you to talk uh, as a panel, and I'm still uh, open to questions and wait, waiting for waves. We are almost uh, toward the end where we share where we can find you all or the work that you do. Um, but I'd love for you to talk about ways as a Southern Maryland region, as community members in this tri-county area, um, how we have been supportive but also how we could be more supportive of your work or your artistry. And even from a student's perspective, thinking about what you would want to see in our community done more of, what, you, what kinds of supports you would like to see. I'm sure our professors and our, <laughs> and our founders of schools have some ideas about how the, how the community can dig in. Any thoughts any of you have jumping in? Sure. Um, I uh, this I know this past year CSM, as Dr. Johnson mentioned, uh, hosted uh, a virtual gallery for the student juried art exhibition, um, and because it was hosted online, um, a lot of the digital work that students had made was able to to be displayed alongside uh, traditional uh, illustrations and oil paintings and ceramic pieces. And it was a really great opportunity for those students to be able to showcase this work. And I think it would be great if more opportunities like that uh, could happen. Um, oftentimes, uh, digital artworks are seen as less effort than mm. physical um, than physical forms of art. And I don't really think that's the case. <laughs> We agree with you, Gabby. I mean, when you think about the knowledge base that it takes to create what you create, um, the creativity to marry the technology and the art of it, um, it's just otherworldly in my, in my view. And so um, it does take um, just as much, if not more, um, creativity and innovation and skill to do what you all do. So I love your suggestion of just more opportunities for uh, digital arts to be seen and experienced by the community. Thank you for sharing that. Any other thoughts? I, I think that the community has actually been very appreciative and, and perceptive about um, the efforts we've made to get these you know, some people have attended concerts, for example, this year for the first time who never would have driven over to Prince Frederick to see a recital or, or the La Plata uh, Theater. And I think you, I've heard expressions from, from several people. I mean, we do have, you know, we have sponsorships, of course, for many of our events. And, um, and they've, you know, they've often come up to me or, or one of the other administrators and said, you know, we really appreciate the fact that you are still doing this, you know, for the gallery shows, particularly for student events like the gallery, the jury show, the student recitals, um, you know, the ensemble concerts. So I think I think just by doing it, we've we've kind of like uh, brought out that that connection with with the, with the community. Yeah, and I I think it's wise of us to consider. Of course, we will always have some things that are just virtual and just in person, but the hybrid of it all has really just shown us how accessible it makes. Um, anything, but definitely the arts to folks who would not otherwise, as you said, made it out really good. There is, there is a double-edged sword aspect to that. Too, though, <laughs> that's the thing. We've had to improvise both the good and the bad sometimes. Yes. The double-edged sword is, is people start getting what they think are innovative ideas. It's, why don't we just eliminate paper completely and have programs on our phones? Oh, yeah. Concerts. And I say, no. <laughs> <laughs> no. What's to prevent you from going on Facebook during the recital? You know? Yeah. <laughs> well, that's that's a thought. The whole thing about the cons and the pros and cons, the positives and negatives. I have now experienced so many concerts where instead of folks just experiencing what's happening on stage, 
you're experiencing it like this, you know, mm -hmm. and that just seems to take away so much of, you know, and to get a picture or a snippet here or there, just to say, I guess I was here, but to experience the whole thing this way, ah, it makes me cringe. So I agree with you, but that's just my personal opinion um, as it relates to pros and cons. Thank you for that. Um, anyone else want to share community, what we can do more of or what we have done? Um, uh, well, one thing that I would say that as far as community recognizing uh, digital media production, the uh, Charles County Police Department every year holds a um, contest where uh, digital media production students can submit 30 second um, uh, ads for like anti theft car uh, stuff. And uh, these submissions, you have the potential of winning money for them. Mm. So I find it's a really good motivator for students to be involved with that because, you know, who's, who's going to pass up free money mm -hmm. and, you know, you're in the program. So you have access to the equipment. So it's, you know, easy to film that. And, you know, uh, my time working in the media lab, I've gotten to help some of the students uh, edit their projects. And I'm, you know, I'm watching the quality of film that they're doing. I'm thinking, wow, you know, this, this is great that not only here's somebody that's very talented, very skilled, but now they have the potential to have their work recognized and be awarded money. I feel that's a really good way to kind of inspire people to get into this program. Um, one area that I think would be nice to see more of in the community, uh, I know down where I live in St. Mary's, uh, every year they have a uh, local film festival. Mm. I wish there was more of that um, because even if it wasn't, something that you would earn money for just to be recognized and to be able to go to a place where like-minded people, you know, are all gathered together. You can make connections, uh, you know, with people who have similar interests. And that's really what you need in, you know, that industry is making connections with people to, you know, help yourself grow, help yourself learn. So, yeah, I, I would like to see more things like community uh, film festivals. I'm, I'm so glad you said that out loud because I wasn't aware and being in the tri-county area for 20 years, I should be. And so, so uh, uh, is it around the similar time of the year every year that St. Mary's does that? Yes, it's usually towards the end of summer. So like August, September. Okay. Yeah, I'll definitely be looking out for it. And um, this is a place, sort of a think tank and discussion where we make suggestions and we bring up thoughts that may not have been thought of before. So, and this will be placed on our website at College of Southern Maryland. So we are putting it out in the air that there should be more film festivals and more opportunities for filmmakers and artists to show their, their work. So thank you for that. Any other ideas about community involvement or support? Go ahead and go. Um, I'm, I'm pretty new here, so I, I'm still learning about, uh, I guess, the community involvement here, but uh, I, I love that idea. I still need to make sure. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think what I would like to see more than anything is, um, is more, I guess, collaboration with some of the local um, music studios, what we're talking about doing um, some audio technology um, expansion, I guess you could say. So having internships available through these studios. Mm -hmm. And not, not only that, but music is a collaboration, it's mm -hmm. a collaborative process. So um, I would love to see more collaboration with other departments mm -hmm. as well, mm -hmm. with DMP, with English, with, um, software, you know, technology and, and just trying to, I guess, just become more interdisciplinary. Yeah. I, so it just popped in my head, Brent, while you were talking, that there are poets, there are writers in, in the CSM English department, setting that to music or recording that in some way, just having the mesh of, of that kind of experience, I think, for students as well as for the consumer to enjoy I love it, putting it out in the atmosphere. So, <laughs> yes, ma'am. Um, STEAM, the, you know, science, technology, engineering, arts, and math, the key component to it is you know, being interdisciplinary. <laughs> so um, when, I, when you were speaking about scoring video games and things like that, I think about um, one video game that I've, been, I've seen played recently is the Miles Morales Spider-Man video game for PlayStation. And um, 
the civil engineering that goes into designing the Manhattan and, you know, there, you, there's so much engineering and the science piece that has to go into, um, you know, video games, there's art, there's so many different components and so many different professions that have to go into it. And so I love the Velocity Center because it is supposed to be a place for interdisciplinary discussion um, to bring all of these different industries together um, and have exposure for our youth in the community, young adults, profession, you know, those um, professionals to come to the, together and have those discussions. So I think that Charles County um, and Southern Maryland in general is taking a huge leap forward with the Velocity Center, with Phoenix International School of the Arts that has a similar mission to the Velocity Center, but um, for young people and um, for these different industries to come together and share resources financial resources, going after grants together, um, human resources, I think is that's exactly where we need to go. Um, if anything, the last 18, 19 months have showed us that we have to come together to really um, make an impact in our community. And so I think the Velocity Center is just an amazing space for that. I'm so excited. It would be really cool if we did see like a recording studio here to, to bring you know, our young people together and have those internships and learn how to do sound engineering and things like that. So um, I, we're in the right direction. And the fact that on these panels, you know, there's follow-up that happens in a million different ways after these panels. So we're looking forward to connecting and collaborating, keyword, right? Um, because the, the entire College of Southern Maryland is available to us in addition to the Velocity Center. So um, at each of the tri-county counties, we have the opportunity to provide resources and to collaborate. So really looking forward to what the, the possibilities really are endless um, when it comes to uh, interdisciplinary learning and growing. We have, um, we would love some virtual questions if you have them. We know you are enjoying this conversation. I'm gathering that through osmosis again. And so, uh, but we would love your questions. We do have one in the audience that I will do my best to repeat. Please share. Oh, that's awesome. So the question, yeah, and I'll come back to you um, for the second question. Um, but the first question is really just asking Dr. Jackson to talk to us about the pipeline, what efforts are being made to connect and, and uh, middle school, high school into the college area uh, as it relates to uh, the charter school that we're so excited about coming this coming school year. <laughs> Thank you so much for your question. Um, so. What's really one of our key pillars for Pasota is access to experts and real world, real world experiences. And so it, um, we have to create pathways for our students to be able to move into their career, uh, whatever it may be. So we actually want to be, um, our goal will be that we will house sixth through 12th grade. So while we're starting at sixth through eighth, um, and, and of course, after eighth grade, families will be able to decide if they want to continue with us or if they want to go to one of the established high schools. But our hope is that they will continue in our program. Um, and so that means that they are engaging in whatever their arts discipline is from sixth grade to 12th grade for at least three hours a day. Um, by the time they get to 12th grade and they're preparing to graduate, they have a portfolio completed. They are doing a senior performance um, for agents um, if they want to get into you know, performing arts. They are having, they're connected to all of the big name conservatories um, and, and arts universities in our region, so on the East Coast and in the Mid-Atlantic. So the goal is that they will continue through our program. So that's one. We will be the only sixth through 12th grade um, school in Charles County. Also, mentorship. So all of our um, arts teachers will be working professionals. Um, those who are working in this area in their arts discipline. Um, and so with that model, we're hoping to start to build some of those mentorship type relationships so that our, um, our arts teachers are able to share their network with the students, um, just, you know, make connections, build apprenticeships, 
So things like that, um, really exposing our students to, um, to what's around here. And, and when I say around here, yes, in Charles County, but of course in DC, Baltimore, um, being exposed to galleries, um, fortunately through the virtual format, they can do it that way as well. And to start having the conversations that they need to have with, um, with people who are working in their arts field. So those are two prominent ways. So the mentorship, um, the seamless 6th through 12th grade model um, are two prominent ways that we are, are building pathways for students to go from their training in middle school, high school, and then continuing either professionally in, in their career field, career field or going into higher education. Really great, um, exciting to see the school emerging in uh, this Tri-County area and all that you're going to be able to do. And I'll just add an FYI, the um, College of Southern Maryland has a dual enrollment program so that you can start as a young person earlier than your 12th grade year experiencing some of the courses. So I'm sure uh, once you're up and running, yeah, you'll be able to start them even earlier than, uh, than right after 12th grade. So your second question would love it. Mm. Yeah, so whether it's science, technology, because all of what you all have explained today um, references the use of <laughs> technology, science, um, some level of engineering, even if it's sound engineering, audio engineering, um, and then, of course, the arts. Um, and would love for you to share what you would share uh, with some young person, even uh, thinking about those middle and high schoolers, Brian and Gabby, what would you share? Um, um, so all of you, maybe we'll make that a perfect closing question before we start sharing some of the resources that you all provide. Uh, we'll start with you, Dr. Ferguson, and work our way down. I guess I would just say that um, it's something that we consume quite often, the arts. I mean, you're listening to music, you're watching movies, and a lot of the things that happen within STEM, I know we're, we're getting into STEAM, but it's, it's about creation and uh, having that training in the humanities and the arts is uh, vital to be able to create like that. Oh, I love that. Even if you are in the most technical pieces of, of STEAM or STEM, the, the, the humanities opens your mind up to even more. I love that marriage. Thank you for that. Yes, sir. Okay, so, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, what I would say to anyone that would be interested, at least getting into digital media production, is that, um, I know for me, I always had this kind of hesitation because I was always nervous about putting out anything that I created because I kind of feared, you know, critiquing of mm -hmm. that, like anybody. <laughs> yeah. But, um, you know, you learn from that. You, you know, if you make something that people rip into, you know, it, it, sure, it might be some mistakes might have been made, but you learn from that. And my suggestion is get over that fear. And if you have an interest, just do it. Even if, even if the first thing you put out is not quality, put it out there, get feedback, learn from that, and then grow, uh, you know, from that experience. And actually, one thing that I would like to see mm -hmm. uh, in the future, I know a lot of uh, younger people that have an interest in digital media production. I would like if uh, uh, colleges had little programs where maybe for like a day or two, high school students could come in kind of get hands on a training on equipment, software, you know, maybe shoot a little project, learn how to edit, just something to inspire them and to show that, you know, if you have an interest in this, there's a place you can go to, to, you know, further your knowledge of this. And yeah, it, it could be both a learning experience and a growing experience and inspire, you know, people to actually pursue this. Yeah. So. Oh, yeah. such great suggestions. I know that we more formally in a classroom setting make available to as, uh, the youngest of our students in Kitty College and, and Summer College at the College of Southern Maryland can take advantage at any age in a lot of the courses and the, the disciplines that we offer. But I think what I hear you saying is as the world opens up, let's have these free open community opportunities where you just get exposure to some of what's happening so you are less afraid to try because you've had exposure to it I love that thank you so much mm -hmm. 
um, definitely just engaging youth and uh, or adults engaging in youth culture. So whether it be esports and video games, whether it's traditional sports, <laughs> um, shoes and fashion, makeup, uh, social media, but what by social media, I mean like monetizing social media and um, connecting those prominent, um, I guess, pastimes and interests and hobbies to STEAM is what I have found to be most successful in, in engaging youth. So whether it's an after school activity or some of the um, youth serving organizations in the county, um, putting on events that connect youth culture to STEAM, I think that you would get a good turnout for those types of things. And I love you. I actually know of a fellowship that I'm, I can share with Dr. Richardson later, but um, a fellowship that um, it, it's actually, it's paid. So students get a stipend, high school students get a stipend to be part of this fellowship where they go to basically speaker series. They meet um, amazing professionals in STEAM um, who talk about their experience, who show them like their laboratory or show them their, their actual place place where they work. And um, by the end of it, students say, oh, okay, I think I do want to get involved during STEAM. Or they say, no, they don't, you know, but they, they have had that exposure. So I think fellowships like that um, would be amazing for students to engage with. I love that. So from a, an adult perspective, engage in youth culture because, and, and make the connections. We, you know, we work hard. I have a middle schooler, so we pull our hair out to say, learn, learn, <laughs> but to make those connections to what they're interested in and how it's connected to what disciplines they should be learning about, I think is amazing. And then to make sure these opportunities are available to our young people. I love it. Thank you so much. Gabby. Um, yeah, so uh, my suggestion for either finding or developing your interest in STEAM is to really um, understand like how all these fields can be in interconnected. Um, like for me, I really enjoy video games, but think about like, what do you enjoy about that video game? Do you like the music composition? Do you mm -hmm. like the sound design? Oh, that's great. The environmental design, the character design. Do you really, um, did you find a game mechanic that there's all aspects are steam are are represented in those things um, on a more science focused side because that's <laughs> my background. Um, think about the ways in which is there something about human beings that you really find interesting? How do you think? How do you process and create language um, or sensory uh, or sensory experiences, your perception, how you decide things, how you reason? That's what really what really pushed me to, I, I, I had this curiosity about them and that pushed me to be like, oh, I want to learn more about these things. So it's keeping that curiosity opened. Um, and not, I guess this is a little sappy, but like keep that curiosity that you've had since you were a child with you. Don't lose that and like really look for the things um, in the things that you already enjoy and pick out like, oh, is this related to STEAM? How can I how can I further my interest or how can I really develop the skills to actually produce something that I find enjoyable? Oh, that is so good. You just made me think of so many things, Gabby. Just the fact that um, there is science and psychology. I think yours is psychobiology, right? So there's psychology behind the technology and that we're utilizing, even behind the arts to even sit and, and think about what someone is thinking or feeling as they are experiencing, whether it's a video game or a, a, a musical piece, a musical composition, what that is allows us a deeper analysis and appreciation for it. So thank you for that. Yes, sir, you have the closing word. Oh, well, uh, I think one area that kind of underscores the interdisciplinary nature of STEAM is actually uh, looking, looking at the, the history of this very, I mean, the very focal point of this is STEAM. And so um, when we, um, uh, Dr. Stephanie McCaslin and I, she's the math and engineering chair at CSM and have, have put together uh, a program we'd, we'd eventually like to present perhaps here at some point or, or through other series of CSM, but basically 
Um, I, I think a good start is what is the foundation of STEM and STEAM? If you look at the Wikipedia talk page on it, it's not clearly decided yet. <laughs> stand yeah. on that. And, and I think one thing I've used with trying to persuade students to understand what's going on is I, I tell them um, just two, two quick little things that um, uh, I used to know uh, a member of the music faculty who's now retired at Towson University, whose husband was an undersecretary in the Obama cabinet. And they basically had these, these same kinds of conversations that, you know, um, you know, even to the point where she, it's, a, it's of course, it's anecdotal. It's like friend of a friend of a friend, but where the president had said something along the lines of, well, STEAM is where we have to go. And um, but one area that I use with my students to understand, sometimes even just using the history or the humor, uh, you know, of that very, you know, that little bit of tension or um, common words, common words that bridge the gap between technology and music, let's say. I mean, the one I always think of, it's, it's probably an apocryphal story, is, um, you know, a lot of people know that Einstein was a violinist. He occasionally would play second violin in a professional quartet, early 20th century. And, um, but there was one piece, I think it was a Beethoven quartet or something, and they were, they were trying to, um, uh, they were trying to get this one movement worked out and, and Einstein kept missing his entrance. And finally, in frustration, the first violinist had said, my dear Einstein, can't you count? <laughs> and, and which underscores, you know, much as with between the, the performing arts and the visual arts, the word tone means two different things. The word yeah. Means two different things. Oh my goodness. Even bridging the gap with a word like count between math and music. Oh yeah. Oh my goodness. The interdisciplinary lessons that could be learned from conversation, communication, learning, and collaboration, I think are endless. And you all have shown um, and proven that in so many different ways. Each of you represents a different industry, a different medium, and a different instrument even <laughs> you're utilizing. And so um, we are so grateful for you. I think online, I would love it for you if you would just help me thank our panelists. Uh, please put that in the chat. What I And here, even in person, thank you. Um, what I'd like to do now is to just share as we are closing opportunities because this is what was said, we want our community to engage with us and to support the arts. And so in the chat, you have um, access to um, some opportunities that are coming up and available. We have, uh, with, with Bev's help, we have put those in the chat. Um, and I'll just name a couple of these and I'd, I'd like for you all to feel free to elaborate or share any that I don't. Uh, to experience the arts at CSM in all of the many ways in which it has been discussed today, uh, csmd.edu forward slash student dash services forward slash arts. And I'll repeat that, but just in case you don't, just go to csmd.edu and look up arts and do a search for the arts and all of the opportunities will come up. csmd.edu forward slash student dash services forward slash arts. And there you will see many upcoming fine arts events uh, that are coming up. Um, I don't know, guys, do you want to talk about them a little bit or shall I list them? You want, go ahead, Dr. Johnson. Uh, well, um, I, I, I don't want to go through the exhaustive list because <laughs> between now and, and the, the December holiday, which there's a lot going on. Mm -hmm. so I already mentioned the two, the two events, faculty recital and Latin ensemble and recital down the street in the box, in the uh, black box. But we, we've also got uh, on November 16th, mm -hmm. a virtual gallery with a professional artist and, and very interesting three-dimensional art. I won't say anything more. Oh my. But if you go over to the, 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 uh, the concert, uh, I mean, the, uh, the campus in La Plata, there's, you know, the, 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 the uh, Tony Hungerford Memorial Gallery. We have his, this gentleman's work all set up. But we've also got, um, this. we hope, hopefully will be our last semester of virtual concerts. We are on track to be live in the, in the spring. Fingers crossed, prayers, yeah. whatever you do. But, but we've we've really excited about the virtual concerts, and we may, you know, carry on some aspects mm -hmm. of those in, in the future. Um, but we our student honors recital in December, 
Uh, the choirs are doing uh, a virtual recital on December 1st. That's mm. very soon. Yeah. And our barbershop harmony chorus um, and the dance, the dance ensemble is again putting together a wonderful 10 minute capstone piece. And they usually pick a theme, for example, Surviving COVID was the theme of their spring concert last year. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, really exciting stuff. So please go to csmd.edu and go to our arts, uh, the arts at CSM page, and you will find out more about what's available to you as a community member. You don't have to go to D.C. to experience the arts. You can do that right in our tri-county area. You can also, I, I think I forgot to mention that Dr. Jackson is a former board member of the Charles County Arts Alliance and their website is charlescountyarts.org to find out more about what's happening in Charles County related to the arts. And of course, we want people to know about the Phoenix International School of the Arts. So if you'd like to say anything about that, it's a Pisota, P -I -S -O -T -A .org. Again, P -I -S -O -T -A .org. And we've listed your social media handles and all that goodness in the chat. Would you like to speak to, to that a little bit? Yes, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. um, so we are currently accepting applications for enrollment. Um, so you can go to pasoda.org and you'll see a button that says apply now. Um, and so we encourage families that have students that are entering grades six and seven for next school year to apply. Um, we only have a limited amount of seats because we are a smaller school model. So we, um, we encourage you to apply soon. Thank apply. You. I have. <laughs> so uh, encouraging you all to do the same. And students, we can't thank you enough for being a part of this. Uh, we know that you have works that you are working on, works that you have already completed, and works that you are planning. If you'd like to share where we can find any of these, or uh, just let us know um, that to be on the lookout for you. And we will do that as well. Well, we'd love to hear. We would love for you to be our actual last word. <laughs> Go for it, Gabby. Um, so <laughs> my social media isn't really like a professional standard. Um, it's like a lot of personal stuff. Acts like. Yeah, well, listen, so hopefully this has empowered you and emboldened you to just continue on and push forward in the work that you're doing. We at CSM are here. The reason why we exist is because of Gabby and Brian and other students. And the work that Dr. Jackson is doing is because of students that are coming behind you. And so it's because of you that we're, we're here. So it's very important that you're here. It's more important that you're here and we're here. So thank you for your voice. We really appreciate it. And Brian, did you want to share anything? Um, yeah, I mean, if anyone is actually interested, uh, <laughs> my handle online is Atomic Bald. There's a whole story that goes along with this. I, 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 we totally understand. I my son's is Panda something. So yeah, <laughs> we get it. <laughs> but, um, so yeah, if you look that up on YouTube, you can see the video projects I've done while I've been in the DMP program and on Instagram and Twitter. Um, I mean, it's a mishmash of personal stuff, but then it's also while I'm in the midst of production, I'll take pictures and post that kind of do little updates of my progression through that project. So yeah, if anyone is interested, uh, Atomic Bald is my handle. I love it. I love it. Atomic Bald. Let's surprise Brian by getting on his social media and encouraging him. Well, I can't thank you all enough, the audience, both virtually and in person, for joining us for this amazing program. Every panelist, you have been amazing. Thank you for taking time out very early on a Wednesday. <laughs> we have, again, one more opportunity for you to join us here in person or virtually for this program series on January 19th. So next year, we will discuss what a makerspace is and how we can use it. And so if you already know what a makerspace is, you want to be here. If you don't know what a makerspace is, you really want to be here. We hope that you'll join us virtually or in person. You simply go to csmd.edu 
forward slash VC series. Again, csmd.edu forward slash VC series to get more information. And there you can also find all of the recordings from our previous series programs uh, that we've had for this series. Have a wonderful day and take care until then. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.